What's up, everybody? It is Finish Strong Friday. Welcome to another episode of Standing Out, a daily podcast about sales, marketing, and leadership. I'm Trey Griggs with Beta Consulting Group. So excited to have you with us today. We got a killer show today. Can't wait to bring out my guest today. It's going to be awesome. Hey, if you would, do us a favor and go to betaconsultinggroup.com and see how we can help you with your sales and marketing strategies. Uh, we're looking out for you, and we would love to help you out in any way that we can. And while you're there, click on the events page and see what's coming up in just one week, eight days. I can't believe it. We've got the Tough Mudder Charity Challenge, the Word on the Street Tough Mudder Charity Challenge, uh, which is going to be brought to you by Zen Freight Solutions. Very excited. They're going to be sponsoring that event and helping us out with that. Um, we're going to be raising money for an organization called Battle Buddy 3 Gun. It's a cool organization, a nonprofit that helps wounded, paralyzed veterans uh, have a sense of hope and community by going on these shooting drills, shooting adventures called three gun, which is pretty cool. So we're going to be doing that on Saturday, April 30th. It is a nine mile 30 obstacle race. we got about seven or eight of us on our team. They're going to be going through that. So very exciting. We'll have pictures. It's going to be a phenomenal weekend. We're going to do a Cardinals game here in St. Louis and just have a lot of fun. So definitely go to betaconsultinggroup.com forward slash events. Learn about that and, uh, and donate to Battle Buddy Three Gun. The link is right there to go ahead and do that. And so we'd love for you to partner with us to help us reach our goal to, to provide these opportunities for wounded to paralyzed veterans to have a sense of hope and community, which is really, really exciting. All right, listen, hey, we've had a killer week of shows. Go back and watch them on demand. You can also catch all of the episodes uh, wherever you get your podcast as well. So uh, Apple, Amazon, uh, Spotify, Pandora, wherever. Uh, go get the podcast and, and listen to them this week. Had an awesome lineup. And next week is an even much more incredible lineup. I'm so excited about uh, the shows that we have next week. On Monday, my good friend Manny Martinez, who is a leadership coach um, and he's a president of Relentless Leadership LLC, is going to be on. We're going to talk about his journey, 30 years in the military and all that he learned through that. One of my best friends on Tuesday, J.D. Gravina, he's the head women's basketball coach at Western Illinois, is going to be on. And man, that's going to be fire. We got some good stories to tell. That's going to be fun. Wednesday, John Calloway, president of LogX down in Springfield, Missouri. Looking forward to that one. My good friend Kyle Lintner on Thursday. He's the VP of Partnerships and Data Analytics at Breaker. This guy's just fire. He's so good good. Um, very sharp. Um, just well-spoken. Can't wait to have him on. And then Friday, a true gem in the industry, Greg Banks. He's a sales leader at JB Hunt Transport. Uh, been in the industry for 25 years and just is like incredible in terms of what he does. So make sure you come back next week, every day, 1030 a.m. Central Time for another episode of Standing Out right here. And of course, a final note before I bring on Christy Knitchell. A huge thanks to our sponsor, Tafts, over in Overland Park, Kansas, Olathe, Kansas, just outside of Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, these are the good guys in freight factoring. They're helping carriers become educated, providing the best products for them, both financially, insurance, other things as well, so that they can grow their business and really thrive in good times and in bad times. Go to Tafts.com to learn more about how um, you can partner with them as a freight broker to provide services for your carriers. Or if you are a carrier owner operator, check them out. They're going to help you out for sure. And tell them Trey sent you. All right, everybody, it is time to bring on our guest today. So excited. I've been looking forward to this one for months when I booked her on the show. Uh, she's somebody I've known for a long time. She is a rock star in the transportation industry, and I just cannot wait to get into it. So everybody, welcome to the show, my good friend, Christy Knitchell. Christy, what's up? Thanks, Trey. Oh, gosh, the sun's up, thank God, today. So <laughs> <laughs> No doubt. It's about time for us to climb out of this winter that just keeps holding on, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's not going away, and it's like doom and gloom, so now it's nice to see the sun's out. So Well, and you're up in Gibsonia, PA, just outside of Pittsburgh. So, of course, you guys get the lingering winters a little bit longer than maybe the rest of us here in the country, but I'm sure it's nice to get that sunshine. And, you know, you got great golf courses up there. you got beautiful parks, so I'm sure it'll be nice to get out and uh, and enjoy uh, enjoy the nature up there as well. So tell us what's good, what's going on. Give everybody a quick intro. I mean, most people who are watching this probably know who you are, including your brother, JR, who says he wants an autograph. Uh, <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> Throw that up on the screen. Yeah, we'll get you an autograph, JR. No problem about that. But for everybody else, Christy, who may not know who you are, give us just a quick 30-second intro of you and what you do at Conicial Logistics. Sure. Um, so I'm the president and CEO of Kanish Logistics. We're a third party logistics provider. Um, the majority of what we do um, is intermodal freight. That's our niche, but we also have a truck brokerage and LTL division, um, family owned business. I took over from my father and um, I've been in the industry for 25 years. So it's yeah, been a uh, challenge. It's awesome. And we met, gosh, I can't remember when we met, but it was, I think it was back when I was at maybe a DAT or maybe at my freight world. I can't remember where I was. We were just really. talking about that. I think it was DAT, then, yeah. then beyond that, maybe Hub Tech and... 
Lane Trucker and, Tools and everywhere else that I've been. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was DAT probably about seven, eight years ago. I got to, I had a chance to come out to uh, Pennsylvania and see you guys play golf with uh, with Matt and some of the guys there in the office at a really cool golf course there and just get to know you guys. I could tell from the beginning from the very first time that I met you guys, that you were a special organization. And I think a lot of that has to do with being a family run organization, but that's not always true. Like family run organizations are not always easy. Talk a little bit about what makes your company so unique and like the culture and the identity. What are you guys really striving for and what, what kind of lends to that being a really special place for people to work? I think what makes us unique was initially, you know, when I first started, there was maybe six of us and having that big family feel um, and continuing that on, obviously, through the years. Um, obviously, working in a family business, like you said, it's not always, you know, good. You have, a, there's a lot of different stresses that come at you. And, um, but I will say, though, it's definitely made me a stronger person um, to be able to do things that I never thought I could do. So, um, you know, just continuing to really, you know, I want people to be heard. I want to um, have them be part of the solution. Um, and that's one of the biggest things I think we do is we listen to our people. You know, we want to hear what they have to say. They're in the everyday um, of the operations. And, you know, and obviously I've done everything in my company the whole way up to the top. So I understand what they're going through. And I do think that that makes us a little bit different, too, because, you know, even, you know, John that runs my company now as well under me, we have the knowledge of a lot of different areas within the company that most leaders might not have. Um, so that I think helps people respect us more because we have been there and we have done it. It's a lot challenging now than it was before, but, um, but I think, you know, that's one thing that makes us unique and then building out the intermodal side, you know, that is all we have done from the beginning initially. And then obviously we branched out into other divisions, but um, you know, truly being that true IMC and there's not a whole lot of us left anymore. So, you know, really knowing that market and being able to, um, you know, thrive in that still is just, you know, impressive to myself. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And shout out to John Christick, who's just an amazing guy. Love that guy. I love uh, every time I get to see him. He was a TIA, so I got to see him there. That was really cool yes, uh, to, to catch up with him there. Now, you said a lot there. I want to unpack. I want to go back and talk about this just a little bit. And one of the things that I've, I heard you say the, the loudest there is that you listen to your people. One thing I've noticed, Christy, is that the really great CEOs out there and the really great leaders within a company are people who intentionally schedule opportunities to listen to their people. My good friend, Jason Lippert, who I reference a lot, he's on LinkedIn everywhere. He runs Lippert Components, $4 billion um, you know, a manufacturer out of Indiana. He, uh, every, I think every two weeks or at least once a month, he goes to one of his shops and has a city town hall. And he just says, whatever you want to say and it's completely open and people just feel comfortable and feel like they can be honest and share good and bad feedback. And man, he's just one of the best leaders that I know. You're one of those best leaders as, as well. How do you facilitate the opportunities for people to share what they think and to really know that they're, they're being heard? Um, you know, we have several ways. I mean, obviously we have a, um, you know, actually it's like a, a box that's like private that people can put anonymous information in there that they want to talk about. Um, and I do think that it's hard sometimes for people to want to speak and come forward, to be quite honest, especially in a group environment. So we also kind of single out people as well. I'm reaching out to people on a one by one basis too, and trying to get their opinion about things and how they feel, but also in, in a group setting, right? Talking with um, whether it's management or people under management, everyone has something that's positive to say, or how can we fix something um, that's challenging for them or make it more efficient, whatever that might be. But, you know, they know they can come into my office, they can talk to John, they can send us emails. But like I said, there's several different ways that we do it. Um, and sometimes, you know, I feel like you got to pull some of that out of people and say, hey, you know, it's not a bad thing to say that we need to look at this or look at that. Like we want to make it better for them. And we want them to feel empowered that we're listening, we might not always go with what they have to say, but we at least listen and have that dialogue back and forth and then explain why we might not go in that direction or look at it, you know, later on in the year. Yeah, I think that's so huge. And it's not, you know, I found this that not every person needs their idea to be implemented uh, if they at least just feel heard, you know, that, hey, this idea was considered because the idea may not end up being the best idea from a merit perspective. But I think as long as they're heard, I think that's the real value. Um, and implementing as much as you can, obviously, makes them just empower them to do even more of that when, when it makes sense. But just making sure that they feel heard, I think, is really, really critical. And I love the fact that you guys do that. And you find not only some channels by which people can do that, but really creating the identity of your company as being one where you really welcome that feedback and you want to hear because they're on the front lines, right? 
right there. They're seeing and hearing things that you guys probably in leadership aren't going to hear uh, from customers and from vendors and other people. And it's just great to have that feedback or ideas. Hey, what if we tweak this? That might make this more efficient. I just think that's really critical from a leadership perspective. It sounds like you guys are doing a lot of that at Conventional. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like I said, at the end of the day, you know, I actually empower everyone to do their job. I'm not looking over their shoulder like I was trained with my father. Um, <laughs> you know, we talk about that, how we would stand behind you. But like, I want them to feel like I trust you. And even if the decision wasn't the best decision or whatever the case may be, I wanted you to make that decision. And let's go back and see what we can do to change and move on and know that it's OK that it didn't work out or what the case may be. So I think that just speaks volumes to people knowing that they're, they can do those things. Yeah. And what better way to learn than to make a decision? And if it is the wrong decision, you have to one, live with the consequences, but two, you have an, a, a, a you know, leader who's going to walk you through maybe why or what you can do better. And so they can actually grow because I think that, you know, when you do that, it just gives people that empowerment, like you said, to make decisions or to think critically or to not be afraid to make mistakes. I think that, you know, our education system teaches kids that failure is bad. And then they come into work and we're trying to teach them, no, 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 failure is actually okay. Like we want to use it as a learning tool to get better. And every, I mean, every CEO that I know, every founder that I know, they understand that failure is a part of the game. And the more that you embrace failure by trying things and learn and grow, you can figure things out. You can pivot faster. So it's like changing the mindset saying, it's okay, make a decision. I'd rather somebody make a decision and it be the wrong decision than to not make a decision at all or feel like they have to ask me for everything because you lose speed. You lose yeah. speed in your business when they have to feel like they go through those hoops or they can't just make a decision on their own. How have you seen speed really impact? Because I mean, you guys are a high growth company. As you said, you're intramodal based, but you've really taken off, especially in some of the other uh, modes as well. How has you know that um, building that culture of trust really kind of um, allowed you guys to grow at speed, especially in the last five years? I mean, I think the biggest thing is, again, like trusting the people to do what they need to do because at the end of the day, like I've done those positions and I've made mistakes and we have people here. I mean, they really get upset when they make mistakes and whatnot, but it, at the end of the day, it's like, we just need to move forward and find out what works best for us. And if it doesn't work, let's pivot fast and go to the next one. You're not going to get yelled at or, you know, have those type of conversations that, you know, I've dealt with in the past. And, you know, it's once you're able to do that and they go through that process and they understand what the goal is. And it's also making sure everyone knows what my, expectations are from leadership down and you know also working together with them like I'm present I go back I say hi to everybody I reach out to everybody um, and everybody being on that same page I know we've had to you know over COVID specifically had to do a better job at like making sure everyone understood all of that um, but I think, you know, we're doing more meetings with like the whole office. We share a lot of data and information that probably most companies don't. Um, and I'm talking whether it's financial information, um, things that like my dad would even say, you know, you don't share that information. Well, at the end of the day, if they don't know where we're at, they're always going to be wondering, are we doing good? Are we not doing yeah. good? that type of stuff, or, you know, Hey, this is where you're at. They might think they're killing it, but they're really not, or whatever the case may be. So I think sharing all those different things um, and making them be part of that, you know, I tell them all the time, you know, I might get a lot of, you know, awards and accolades, but I wouldn't be here without the team I have behind me Right. at all. I mean, I, there's a lot of stuff like you brought up, John, like there's a lot of stuff he does. I could not do. So it's building that team of people you trust that are smarter than you that can help carry out your goals and expectations. No, absolutely. And I love what Chris had to say. Chris, thanks for watching today. You know, freedom to fail and learn from it is huge in development. I couldn't agree with that more. It's just so critical to have that freedom to be able to make those decisions, to fail a little bit and to work through that and to grow. It's great for personal development and it's great for your culture. It's great for, for all that yeah. as well. So let's go back to another thing as well that you said that I think is really critical. Um, you know, some CEOs come into an organization, maybe from outside the organization, and they haven't lived through all of those jobs. Some of the best CEOs that I've, I've ever met are people that started from the bottom or you know had every job i remember the first time that i uh that i met josh england who you know runs cr england out in salt lake city he talked about how you know in order for them to become you know in the leadership team at england one they had to go get an mba from uh, an institution two they had to work two years at another company to learn all about that and then three they had to start at the bottom and, and work every job and work their way up. And I thought that was really critical advice to think about that of like, put yourself in the shoes of everybody that you are asking to do something for your company, for your dream, for, for what you're building, like put yourself in those shoes 
And that way you'll know kind of what they're experiencing. How has that experience really impacted your leadership when you're working with somebody who's collecting invoice, you know, or even processing invoices or collecting bills or booking loads or whatever it is, knowing what that position is like, how has that helped you as a leader to have empathy for everybody in your organization? I mean, it's helped me tremendously because, again, when I came in, I was an intermodal dispatcher, and then I got to go out and do sales and got to do conferences with my father. Then I did some intermodal pricing, booked some trucks. On the LTL side, I did HR, claims, finance. Even when we implemented a new system years ago, um, the finance part didn't work. I was working from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Like At the end of the day, it's not my job to say, hey, I have, I'm paying you to do it. I needed to know every aspect so that I understand what, how everything, you know, works together, how each department affects each other. Because I can tell you right now, when you bring up finance, for example, a lot of people probably think finance, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? At the end of the day, they're depending on operations to put proper notes in the system so they can bill out the customers properly. And actually, one of the girls that we have in finance used to work in intermodal. So she understands like the op side of it even. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so it, it's truly important. And it's important to me because, again, I feel like I get the respect too, because I have done their job. Yes, it's quite different now than it was when I first started 25 years ago. But I still am willing to jump in, have those conversations. I understand the pain they're going through right now with a lot of the different issues. Um, and I, again, I just think you get the respect from that and it, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's something I, I can't even explain, but I feel it's very beneficial. Cause as you know, I actually did not graduate from college. I went, but decided it wasn't my path and just started with my dad when I was 19 and never went back. So yeah. Yeah. And, and you learned probably quite a bit through the experience with your dad. You probably got a, a, you know, an MBA uh, just by doing that. But you know, it's interesting. I think about uh, like, like your role now as CEO and how many people do you have in your organization now? What do you guys up to now? I want to say we have roughly 50 um, in yeah. that range. And then we have an agent network as well, um, which is growing pretty rapidly. We have some yeah. people in Columbia as well through staffing companies. So we're getting up there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, when I think th this is the picture that I've been thinking about a lot from a CEO perspective, but also from a leadership perspective, and that is the idea of a symphony and specifically the conductor. When I was in high school, I got to be in the full orchestra. It was really fun. I played French horn. I was terrible, but it was fun. And <laughs> our conductor was a guy named Kurt Mosier, who I believe is still in Kansas City, like just a genius. He wrote a lot of the music uh, that we played, but he also just, you know, obviously conducted music that he had picked. But what I, I knew about Kurt was at any time, anybody in the symphony, if they were having trouble with their instrument, whether it be fixing it or playing it, he would literally come down from being a conductor. He would go and he'd pick up the instrument and he'd start playing it like a trombone, just start playing it. Like he knew how to play every instrument. And I don't know if every conductor can do this. I mean, maybe not, but this guy could play every instrument in the, the orchestra, but he never played them. He was the conductor. He went up, he, his job was to make everybody play a beautiful sound together um, and that was his job, but he knew how to play every one of those instruments. And it, it, that's a lot like what a CEO should be like, you know, that you don't, you're not going to, you're not going to process the invoices, but you should know how to do it so you can help them just to give a little tip or I know what this is like, or, Hey, I understand it's stressful or whatever. You can, you can speak to that, even though you're the one conducting, kind of creating this beautiful sound. That's kind of the picture I've been thinking of lately. And that's really what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And again, um, you, I think you gain the respect of your people and you just understand how each division um, affects each other. Right. And, and I will say, too, one thing I'm very proud of is I have a team of managers here that have grown within the company. Um, John, that runs the company, has been here 17 years and he worked in pricing and intermodal and he's moved up. And, you know, a lot of our management has been here a long time and it's been very exciting to see like how they've grown through the years with myself. Even we've all just, you know, it's just been crazy to see how we've all evolved. And it shows the people who are getting started now who have only been there a year that there's opportunity. You know, they keep working, keep learning. There's opportunity for whether it be the getting the right job that's just really fulfilling or maybe moving into leadership. And so it's really cool that you guys have, have that culture going. Okay, listen, this is going by way too fast. We're already at 20 minutes. All right. So I want to spend the last 10 minutes focusing on, on something that is really, really important to you and something that I love about you and how you approach uh, your, your own life and just about the industry as well. And that is the idea of mentorship, specifically with other women in logistics. One thing I've seen you do better than anybody is to take uh, maybe some newer people in the industry, uh, some younger leaders, um, specifically women, and help them navigate through the waters of being a woman in logistics, being a leader, growing. Talk about why that's so critical to you and you know, kind of where that all started and, and why that, that means so much to you. 
Yeah, so it all started um, when I was younger, obviously working for my father and it was very male dominated. Um, I think most, you know, industries are probably male dominated, to be quite honest, but specifically in our space. And we had customers that didn't want to talk to me. We had carriers that didn't want to talk to me because I was a woman. I was a manager, but I was a woman. My dad had to um, get on the phone and deal with those situations. And even as you know, we, I continued to grow up within the business, going to meetings um, where I was the only woman in the room out of like 100 people, um, it was very intimidating. Um, even speaking and putting myself out there, as much as that's something I didn't want to do, I felt like, you know what, I have to do that because we need to have a voice. We need to be heard. Um, I didn't graduate college, like I said, but at the end of the day, I could still do this and figure it out because I worked hard. And then being smart enough to hire smarter people than myself, um, you know, that type of thing. So it's truly something that's hit me within the industry that um, I felt that, you know, there's a a lot of women that are out there and I'm finding more, they just don't speak up. They're not being heard. Uh, maybe they feel they, they can't be or whatnot, but I feel like we got to build this community around that so that they understand it's okay. And they need to be heard because I mean, we're killing it out there. Yeah, no, I love that. And there's some that obviously you've had an impact on our good friend, Nicole Glenn, that you've had a chance to network with um, our friend Raquel Packets right there in Butler PA close to you and many others that you've had a chance to impact throughout you know, your career and to help them along the way. I think that's really critical, but it's not just for them. I mean, obviously they benefit greatly. What has it done for you as a leader to be a mentor and to be somebody who is you know, helping other, other women along? I can tell you um, it's very inspiring. It's one of those things too, when even women say to me, like, you know, I've been trying to find you and I want to talk to you. And like, you're just so inspired. Like, I don't even know what to say sometimes, you know, but at the end of the day, but you are, I'll just say you are. So, you know, you have to live <laughs> well, with that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, no, cause it's like, I just feel like it's not like I'm trying to get anything, um, you know, I, yeah, I'm trying to get something out of it and that's to make other people better. And it's also so that we can work better together. So like you brought up Nicole Glenn, for example, um, she actually reached out to me specifically to ask, you know, how did I grow my company? And we talked about things, but now we talk about a lot of things. How do you do this? How do you know? So I'm also gaining knowledge from how she does things or other companies that I'm working with. Um, I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from other women asking for help, but yet I'm asking them for help too. How did you do this? Cause you do this better than what we are. Um, and they're very transparent. Um, so I just feel like building that network and being able to share and help each other is really what I've been trying to do for a long time, even with men in our industry. I've built relationships with men as well that we're able like to myself. Exactly. Yeah. I benefited greatly from our relationship, you know. Right. And that's the thing. It's it's all about it's not about me doing better than you and me being like that top person out there. I want to see other people rise and do that. And they just don't know how to, or where to go to get the help. And it was a struggle for me, but I figured it out. So I want to be able to help others. So it's not a struggle for them. Yeah, no, I think that's so great. I mean, it's definitely a two-way street. Not only are you providing a lot of insights for them, but you're getting a lot in return as well. And I can't remember who said this quote, so I apologize not being able to get credit for it. But I love this quote that says that every person that I meet is my superior in that I can learn of them. And I love that idea that it doesn't matter where people are in their journey. You can still learn something from them. Maybe it's parenting. Maybe it's organization. Maybe it's how to be a better public speaker or something. I mean, whatever. Everybody has their kind of area of expertise. And the more that you spend time talking to people, you're going to find out what that is. And that's just going to benefit you as well. But the other benefit, too, that we mentioned before we came on the air is it really forces you to know what you believe or to understand kind of what you really think. Like if you have to communicate why you do something in your business, you better actually know it. Like you better, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll make, it'll solidify it. I think is the right word, right? It'll, yeah. it'll make it more concrete in your mind. And that's a benefit as a leader to have clarity in terms of what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and at the end of the day, too, we support numerous women organizations like Dress for Success and Chatham's Entrepreneurship for Women and Strong uh, Women, Strong Girls and I mean, other organizations as well. But it's about giving back and helping and letting them, them know that there's a pathway out there for them. Um, you know, at the end of the day and the, the company knows, you know, what we, we push in. And then we have multiple people here within our company. You know, we want to say 62% of our staff is women. Um, but it's also the fact that like they're getting involved in these things as well. And it's near and dear to them. And it, and it 
means a lot to them. And another thing we've done too, just to kind of put a shout out there to Rita Weber, but we brought in a woman leadership coach as well, because we've worked with men, right? Not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I felt, well, maybe the women would feel a little bit more comfortable working with a woman leadership coach. And I'm curious, like how that would work, you know? And the group of women that we had, I mean, they loved it. It was absolutely something I think that most companies should look at doing. But on top of that, John that runs my company is working with her too on how to better work with women and help lift them up as well. Cause we need men to understand how important it is to also help raise awareness that women can do these jobs. And it's just really whoever is best for the job at the end of the day, but there's a lot of qualified women that just need that support all around. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And what a great idea uh, to, to, to bring in a woman coach just to see how it would be different and, uh, and just a little more relatable, right? I mean, like, I think that a woman can express uh, a little more empathy uh, just because they've been in, the, in those shoes and, and are maybe a little more relatable. So kudos to you for that. I love what Richard Hagan said. Richard, thank you so much for watching the show today. I appreciate that. You know, he says that CEOs that understand that respect is earned um, and are much better positioned than ones who demand it through intimidation. I love that. Like, you, you, yeah. you really have to earn it from your team. And Christy, you have definitely earned it from your team. I've seen it. I've been in your office before. I get to talk to the people that, that you have with you, like John and Matthew and, and others that are in your organization. And I can definitely tell that you've done that. So kudos to you. And real quick, before we transition, because I got one question I want to ask you on a personal note here, just a minute, I'll put you on the spot. But before that, um, tell everybody just one little tip about how to get started in mentorship. Like, like how do you connect with people? And what's the typical time that you try to invest in people? Is it once a month? Is it once a week? Is it for a half hour? Like, what are just some of the quick nuts and bolts of mentorship that you've uh, found to be successful? I mean, I would say for me, I mean, the biggest thing was I mean, initially I actually was part of local Pittsburgh women mentoring day and like working, you know, with that and people wanted to talk with me. So my biggest thing is reach out to people that you want to talk about to, you know, or learn from because of what they've done. Um, and that's, that's the biggest piece of advice I could give is because at the end of the day, most of us are willing to help and talk with you. I think some women are like shocked that I would give my time. And, and honestly, I think it's very important for me to give my time because we can benefit both ways, but it just depends on the situation. Some people I have to work with a little bit more, some people not as much, but someone like Nicole Glenn, for example, just to bring her up again, we've become close friends. So it's just like, you know, it's here and there, or now we talk about friend stuff or, um, you know, whatever the time I need to put in, I'm going to do it because I feel like it's important to me. Um, and I have a very busy schedule, but as many people as I can help, I'm willing to take that on. Um, some other people might obviously have schedules that revolve around that and can't put as much into it. But I mean, there's several women that I'm still continuously working with that, you know, take up some time. And, you know, I'm also learning too, just from that, like I said, and it's, it's definitely very um, helpful. And there's other women that have reached out to me and I've reached out to them and, you know, we haven't talked in, you know, a while, but we still stay in touch. But when something else comes up, I know I can reach out to them and depend on getting some help whenever that is, which is, that's the biggest part, building that network of people you can trust and talk about business and you don't care about the fact that you might be competitors or whatever it is. You're just trying to help them be better. Just like you're going to be better because I can learn something either way. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love that. And you know what I found too, is that really great leaders, like leaders who have that, that teacher coach mentality and who have a high level of empathy for other people. I think they really respect it when somebody will reach out and say, would you spend time with me? Would you teach me what you know? Would you help me grow? I think really great leaders, embrace that and are very excited to help out in those ways. Absolutely. I agree hundred percent. It's like compliment, right? Like, why do you want it? Why'd you reach out to me? You know, like I'm just your typical person running, you know, a business trying to work hard. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. So 30 minutes is almost up. I got one quick question for you. This will be a very easy answer. I know that you love to go to rock concerts. All right. Yeah. What's the next concert on Christy Knitchell's calendar for 2022? What, what are you hitting next? What band? Well, it's funny you say that. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I was just looking last night. Um, because, of course you were. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I went to one in uh, Kentucky last year, actually. That was a four-day uh, festival. But um, but honestly, I don't have one booked, but I'm looking forward to going to one, um, whether it be uh, Papa Roach is one of my favorite ones I haven't seen in a while, to be quite honest. Um, I know Metallica is uh, touring again as well, and they were really good last year, so... 
Who's the one band that you really want to see you haven't seen yet that you just you gotta you gotta get to them? What's the oh one band? Gosh. I don't know because I've seen almost like all of the ones I want to see. <laughs> to be quite yeah. honest, um, there's probably not one I can even think of. You're now recycling. You're just going back to the ones you. Really yeah, like the most, I mean, I go to great. a lot of festivals, <laughs> so you get yeah, to see like great. sometimes a hundred bands. Um, yeah, yeah, in the amount of That's time. Awesome. So. So, That's you know. awesome. Well, Christy, thank you so much for being on the show today. I've really enjoyed this, and I know that our, our, our viewers have as well. And I hope that you'll come back and see us again. I want to get you back on the show. That'd yeah, absolutely. Cool that would be you. awesome. Yeah, excellent. And for everybody else who's watching, make sure you come back next week for our lineup. It's going to be awesome. And if you've never caught my weekly podcast, Word on the Street, it's at noon central. So coming up here in just about, about an hour, uh, we got our guest Kyle Lintner on today of Breaker Logistics. He's going to be talking about what he's doing over there, some really cool technology that they're building out there, and many other things that are in the freight industry. Christy, you've been on that show before. It's I have. a lot of fun. It's a crazy yeah. crew. Uh, we're going to have a good time. It's an hour long. It starts at noon central right here on LinkedIn Live, YouTube, or Twitter. So come back and check that out today if you've never seen that before. And everybody have a wonderful, wonderful day, wonderful weekend. It's Finish Strong Friday. Whatever you're doing, get after it. And we'll see you guys again for another episode of Standing Out, a daily podcast about sales, marketing, and leadership powered by Beta Consulting Group. And thanks to our friends over at TAS. We'll see you guys later.